Hey guys, today we are here to show you a horrifying story. Stay with me till end to know the ancient cradle of evil. The cradle of evil. For weeks, the young farmhand had suffered from increasingly severe headaches that radiated from his temples to his neck. At night, he would lie in bed, burning with a fever, leaving him to long for the southwesterly breeze to sweep through his room and relieve his suffering. When he was not suffering from the heat, he was shivering in the cold, waking up every few hours, only to find that he had again wet the bed. These restless nights left him exhausted, with bloodshot eyes, ringing in the ears, nausea, vomiting, and vertigo. His father took notice and urged him to seek help. After trying various treatments, none of which were successful, his condition worsened. His symptoms became unbearable, and he drifted into an almost catatonic state, seemingly detached from reality. Until one evening, delirious, he found himself lying in bed with his father standing over him praying. As his outstretched body convulsed, a priest stood at his bedside, demanding to know the name of the demon who had caused this. For three days, the demon refused to divulge his identity. The priest, unrelenting, called out to the demon, whether you be a strange spirit, whose name nobody knows, or a roving spirit, or the tortured spirit of someone who was abandoned, abused, lonely, drowned, starved, burned, murdered, or an evil spirit sent. From hell, give me your name. The priest anointed the young man's head with oil and water that had been blessed. He then flushed the young man's ear using a solution of beer and medicinal herbs until outstreamed fluid and black bits of dead flies. Upon realizing what his body just purged, he cried out, I am truly grieved, confused and troubled. Shall I kneel for your judgment? Save me so that I may not be wronged. The priest comforted the crying young man. He instructed the father to administer the ear solution along with other medications and advised that his son would be fully cured within a month. He left the grateful family to pray for thanks and celebrate in their victory over the Lord of Flies. This account was based on a series of Sumerian exorcism texts that are over 3,600 years old. Similar methods and dialogue between the priests and possessed were outlined in these ancient clay tablets. These were considered medical texts, in addition to spiritual ones, so their methods and practices blurred the lines between body and spirit. The ancient Sumerian exorcism tablets were discovered by archaeologists in the Royal Library of Ashurbanipal. The Library of Ashurbanipal, named after the last great king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, contained thousands of clay tablets dating as far back as the 7th century BCE. The original tablets are in the British Museum. The museum has about 1,000 cuneiform tablets, of which 660 reference exorcism. The Mesopotamian Hell Plaque. On the top first row are divine symbols like those typically found on boundary stones, including the symbol of Utu. Utu, later known as Shamash, was the ancient Mesopotamian sun god. He represented truth, justice, and morality. According to Sumerian mythology, Utu was the twin brother of the goddess Inanna, the queen of heaven. He would spend his days traveling through the sky in a sun chariot, keeping a watchful eye on all the humans below. It was believed that he was very powerful and would intervene between demons and humans to help those in distress and enforce divine retribution. Utu was depicted as a solar disk, this appeared as a circle with a four-pointed star pointing to the cardinal directions, like a compass. Overlapping that were four wavy lines stemming from the center between each of the points on the four-pointed star. This symbol is seen all over Mesopotamian art, as it symbolized warmth and light from the sun, as well as power. Also included on the top, are the symbols for other deities such as Ea, depicted by a mace with ram's head, Marduk by a spearhead, Adad by a lightning fork, Nebo by his double staff, Ishtar by an eight-pointed star, Sin by the crescent, and the Sabidi, identified with the Pleiadian star system and depicted as seven circles, the second row shows seven Galu, the earliest root of the word Ghul, demons that carried victims off to the Mesopotamian underworld, having the heads of animals. 
These animal-human hybrid beings are a common element among human depictions of demons. It is a theme that arises from the pressures of adapting from a primitive or wild existence to one that is more civilized. This theme is found throughout ancient art and proto-literature, hinting to a dualistic concept of good versus evil, or the struggle between wild man and civilized man. The third row of the exorcism tablet shows that actual exorcism right. In the middle, a possessed person lies on a bed. At the head and foot of the bed are priests, identified by their fish-like robes, which indicate that they are priests of the water god, Ea. A demon behind the right priest holds two other demons at bay. The other priest holds a lamp, which symbolizes the god of fire, Nusku. The last row shows objects such as a bowl, water bladder, two jars, and various foods. These are offerings for the demons. In the very center of this last row, a large depiction of the demon Lamashtu holds a snake each hand. She breastfeeds two pigs and kneels on a donkey, which is her symbol. The donkey is resting on a ship, sailing on water where there are fish swimming from left to right. To Lamash, two's left is her threatening husband, Pazuzu, who is trying to attack her with a whip. Pazuzu was summoned by the priests to defend the patient from her. This is a common theme in the Pazuzu slash Lamashta story. Pazuzu was often invoked to protect pregnant women and mothers against Lamashtu, because she would steal their babies out of jealousy. This was the explanation for miscarriages, stillborn infants, and sudden infant death, making tablets and amulets of Pazuzu some of the most popular in the first millennium in Mesopotamia. In the temple schools of Mesopotamia, students learned exorcism rituals, how to mix healing ointments, perform astrology, and treat diseases as possessions, these skills seem archaic now, but the temple schools served as the first medical schools. They even trained their students on the study of contract law, ethics, medical billing, and accounting. They were hubs of intellectual activity. The temple priests produced textbooks to train young medical students, the candidates of the priesthood. As a result of the Sumerians' meticulous record-keeping, archaeologists are able to study their early medical knowledge and religious beliefs. What they have found is that the Sumerians believed certain spirits caused specific diseases, which could be identified through a patient's symptoms. This spirit entity would enter the body through the patient's head. It was important for the priest to know the name of the entity so that he could prescribe the right treatment. It was as though the names of the demons were the names of the diseases. For instance, one tablet refers to the practice of rubbing someone's head with butter and milk so they would be cleansed of the head disease of heaven, Thompson, 1924. If you like this video, please help me by hitting the like button, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell, so you will not miss any new videos like this. Possessions in Mesopotamia were not limited to head diseases. Symptoms of demonic possession could be felt throughout the entire body. According to another tablet, symptoms of demonic possession can begin in the muscles of the body. The possessed patient can have fever and chills, intestinal problems, pain in the abdomen that radiates to the back, as well as chest pain, ibid. In this case, the demon did not attack the head, However, the treatment calls for purifying the patient with water, then wrapping his head with a bandage and juniper leaves. He must leave this bandage on for one full day, then discard it. This method supposedly drew the demon out of the patient's head, another method of purification was to make a funerary offering to the spirit, such as bread, beer, or water. The patient would take the skull of a dog and fill it with beer, then pour the beer onto the ground and dedicate it to the demon. In this method, the demon would be drawn to the foods and thus lured out of the patient. Although clearly strange, there was an element of reasoning behind it. The Sumerians did not believe in just one type of spirit. They believed in entities similar to demons, devils, and even ghosts, all of which could enter a person through possession. Some were demons from the underworld and others were simply sad, lost souls. In order to know the difference, the exorcist would pay close attention to the patient's symptoms, as well as consult his manual. 
For example, if a person in life was unloved, abused, and neglected to the point wherein they were starved to death, that tortured soul would seek to inhabit the body of someone else. Once in that body, however, their tortured nature would be expressed in the patient. This could make the patient feel symptoms of depression, loneliness, nausea, loss of appetite, chill, and weakness. Therefore, the healing rite, or exorcism, could include making a nice meal for the spirit and offering it positive affirmations, in addition to medicinal herbs, this practice offers a glimpse into the minds and hearts of ancient people. Regardless of the science or logic, it does indeed show a level of compassion on their part. Rather than demonize even a demon, they sought to understand and make an emotional appeal. This is in contrast to the modern depictions of exorcism and possession, which usually portray coarse, demanding exorcists who show no mercy. To the Sumerians, things were not always black and white. This accounts for the popularity of Pazuzu as a protective figure, while also being the harbinger of evil. They believed that even the most harmful demon could be helpful. Everyday Demons the belief in a wide variety of evil demons and protective spirits heavily influenced the life of Mesopotamians. The label of demons as avatars of evil allowed ancient people to identify a threat like disease or bad weather so that they might fight it by using the proper rituals. Throughout Mesopotamian history, the belief in the existence of evil and protective forces was rooted deep into their psyche. They did not see these entities the same way we might today. Although they were evil, they also defended against evil. The lines between good and bad were sometimes blurred, or perhaps more accurately, seen as harmful and useful. The threats of disease and death that hovered over people, whose precarious living conditions made them more vulnerable to disease and misfortune, made it necessary to appoint others who were well versed in understanding how to fight against these threats. Henceforth, the exorcist priest would become a legitimized profession, making it an important part of civil society. These holy leaders and proto-physicians made it possible to circumscribe the dangers of everyday life and implement ways to prevent or even defeat them. Around the third millennium, priests started creating a vast repertoire of demons with superhuman powers and invented all kinds of rituals and magical treatments in order to provide a cure. To fight against the demonic possession that they believed responsible for serious physical and spiritual disease, conjuring rituals were established to summon protective demons, like Pazuzu. Archaeologists have excavated a host of protective demons in houses and administrative centers, often, these clay figures were buried under their foundations as a defense against potential threats. Babylonian Exile the Kingdom of Judah came under Babylonian rule at the end of the 7th century BCE, after the Babylonians overthrew the Assyrian Empire. Judah had been a vassal state of the Assyrian Empire since the mid-8th century BCE. In the Confu. Shaun that arose after the fall of the Assyrian Empire, the Egyptians tried to seize power in the western lands. King Jehoiakim of Judah joined the Egyptians but was defeated by the Babylonians. After the fall of the Jewish capital Jerusalem in 597 BCE, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II deported the new king Jehoiakim, his court, and most of the Jewish elite to Babylon. Two later Jewish uprisings led to further deportations in 586 BCE, when the Babylonians also destroyed the Temple of Solomon and most of Jerusalem, and 582 BCE although not treated very well, the Jews in Babylon were left alone to marry, raise a family, farm, buy property, and raise capital. Despite the absence of bloody persecutions, the exile was traumatic for the Jews. They felt imprisoned and mistreated. While they were subject to foreign domination, their land, which had been assigned to them by their god, was destroyed. Exile therefore had an immense influence on the Jewish identity. The Jews would become closer as a people and as a religious group, but they would also come to adopt new ideas and customs. The Mesopotamian Toilet Demon Many passages in the Babylonian Talmud warn against Shed Bet Hakai's The Toilet Demon. There were a variety of warnings about toilet behavior and one's safety and defense against this toilet demon. 
One warning was that after coming from the toilet, one mustn't have sexual intercourse immediately or else his children will be epileptic, Bamberger, 2013. Again, we see that epilepsy is associated with demonic entities. The notion that epilepsy is caused by demons was widely believed in ancient Mesopotamia. The Babylonian Talmud prescribed the wearing of certain amulets to prevent epilepsy attacks. This is parallel to the beliefs of the Akkadians, who warned of the same demon whom they called Sulak, who caused similar symptoms. The demon from both the Akkadian records and Babylonian Talmud resembles a lion or sometimes a goat being, lives in toilets, and causes epilepsy, strokes, or sudden falls. The Akkadian version of the toilet demon is mentioned in a medical handbook used in Babylon from about 1000 BCE. The text focuses on epilepsy and stroke. It mentions the belief that if someone falls on his left side during an epileptic seizure or a stoke, it was because of having been struck down by the hand of the toilet demon. Egyptian Influence As a displaced people, the Jews encountered many different beliefs and cultures, often integrating aspects of them into their own beliefs, even though they tried very hard to keep their own beliefs intact. In another case of cultural diffusion, the time the Jews spent in Egypt may have also influenced their ideas of demons. Historians and archaeologists often dispute the idea of the Jewish presence in Egypt, citing no archaeological evidence. Many scholars also find parts of the story too fantastic, like when Moses parts the Red Sea so that his people may pass through it. Additionally, archaeologists have no Egyptian primary source accounts referencing slaves, plagues, or an exodus and subsequent wandering people. However, religious scholars take the story to be true and have made some interesting connections as a result. According to some rabbinical scholars, the many demons and deities of the Egyptian pantheon influenced the Jewish people and their idea of evil.